Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I know some of you have been to Paris over the weekend, and uh, if the reputation of the French that we'll be touching on today is anything to go by, you will have had a, uh, a bit of a party. So uh, congratulations for staying awake this evening for my lecture. Um, actually, this talk has come at a good time for a number of reasons, uh, not only because some of you will have traveled through the Channel Tunnel recently, but also because on Friday, it was the 20th birthday of the Eurostar. Uh, whoop. No? No one excited about 20th birthday of the Eurostar? No? So, uh, yes, one, one excited person. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, well, very exciting to, to me, as I have uh, developed a geeky obsession with the uh, Channel Tunnel, but I confess, not the most momentous day for most British people. But in many ways, uh, I think it should be. Uh, almost 200 years have passed in between the first proposal for a Channel Tunnel in 1802 and its eventual opening. It's the world's longest undersea tunnel, deemed the most significant major building project of the last 100 years by the International Federation of Consulting Engineers, and 10 people died while building it. But when you're actually traveling through it in the dark with only bilingual safety announcements and those little doors you can press to entertain you, uh, it doesn't seem that exciting. It's easy to forget you're in the middle of experiencing a modern miracle of engineering. Despite a uh, largely indifferent public here in Britain, at least, the 20th anniversary of Eurotunnel drew quite a lot of pe press coverage and a few words on the radio. According to an article in the Daily Telegraph last week, champagne corks will fly at what Eurotunnel describes as the glamorous end of the Channel Tunnel in France. Uh, there are two things here which seem to me in keeping with the history of the ja Channel Tunnel in general. The first is that celebrations went on at the French end throughout its history from conception to execution to its ongoing operational status. The French have been much more enthusiastic about the Channel Tunnel than we British have. In fact, British feeling about the tunnel has been decidedly ambivalent, if not negative. Uh, on the other hand, it's this reference to the glamorous end, and I can't help but feel the journalist adds France as an unnecessary uh, addition to that sentence. Uh, it has ever been thus, the French having the reputation for being elegant, sophisticated and glamorous, all words with French origins, while the British consider themselves more homely, a Middle English word. It amuses me that Eurostar used to travel from Waterloo Station, uh, named of course for the famous battle in which the British military, or if we're strictly honest, a coalition which featured the British, defeated French Napoleon. It's a very concise way of saying to the French person who has just hopped off Le Shuttle, welcome to Britain, now please contemplate your past military inferiority. The British, smug since 1815. Uh, Waterloo has a birthday coming up as well, a 200th anniversary in June, so no doubt we'll be hearing more about that in coming months. In fact, coincidentally, the Battle of Waterloo is of consequence to the story of the Channel Tunnel, which starts not long before the Napoleonic Wars begin. Today's lecture is a cultural history of the Channel Tunnel because it focuses less on the achievements of engineering, which are genuinely astonishing, and wrangles over the project's funding, which are genuinely astonishingly tedious, uh, than in understanding national cultural responses to the Channel Tunnel and what its story can tell us about the changing nature of Anglo-French relations. Over the course of history, we have been friends and we have been enemies, but however you look at it, the British and the French have been profoundly connected. You might even argue that we're family at the level of our DNA. A study at Oxford University in 2013 of the DNA of peoples of the British Isles found that a substantial amount of an ancient British DNA most closely matches the DNA of modern inhabitants of France. But as we all know, people within the same family can be radically different to each other. Indeed, comparing and contrasting ourselves to closest members of our family can be part of how we define who we are. In Britain, you'll find both Francophobes, those who hate or are at least highly suspicious of the French and all things French, and Francophiles, those who are the French people's biggest fans. What both of these groups tend to share, however, is an emphasis on the idea that the French are very different to us. At its narrowest point, the channel which separates England from France is only 20.6 miles wide, yet the cultural gap between England and France might make you believe that it's far larger. Perhaps that's wishful thinking on some British people's part. 19th century British writer Douglas William Gerald once wrote, the best thing I know between France and England is the sea. The British have historically been wary of building a channel tunnel. 
This seems surprising at first glance since it's Britain which is isolated from European neighbours, not the French, who are spoilt for choice. One might argue that the Channel Tunnel is heavily to the advantage of Britain, the island nation which needs the inflow of money, people and ideas from the continent, as it has done since as far back as the Bronze Age. Not to mention somewhere reliably sunny to go on our holidays and a chance to escape our own not always exciting cuisine. The French, on the other hand, are not that into our climate and I think we all know how they feel about our food. The answer lies in the tradition of British isolationism, an attachment to sea borders as a way of insulating ourselves from the world. Britannia is an icon of Britishness. She was invented by the Romans, but curiously is often conflated with Boudicca, uh, the ancient Briton, queen of the Iceni tribe, whose mark of distinction was fighting off the Romans. Uh, B Britannia was revived by the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I, during the Renaissance, given a publicity boost during the time of the Acts of Union in 1707, and armed with a nice big spiky trident by the Victorians, who were getting busy ruling the waves. Later, she made some reappearances in cartoons in connection with another strong female British leader, Margaret Thatcher. Of course, a close look at Britannia reminds us that, paradoxically, Britain in the form we know it now simply couldn't exist without the influence of nations beyond its borders. Britannia was, of course, an invention of invaders, the Romans, and still wears a Corinthian helmet. She stands for untouchability, virginity, isolation, and an identity which depends upon the impregnability of sea borders. But read another way, she is a reminder that it was invaders who helped to create the nation she represents. Britain has often seen the outside world as potential attackers, and by styling itself as a virginal, virginal warrior woman, it has found an emotional expression of its perception of itself as pure, vulnerable, yet ready to fight. Shakespeare seems to style Britain as a woman when he writes Richard II and gives John of Gaunt his famous speech celebrating England. The nation is a womb of royal kings and pure, both morally, this other Eden, and in hygienic terms, this fortress against infection. Shakespeare's emphasis is firmly on how important borders are to England. The Silver Sea serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands. Of course, the monarch on the throne at the time, the embodiment of the nation, was Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, so these tropes were particularly apt. But it's worth wondering whether Shakespeare's tongue was in his cheek when he wrote this. After all, Richard II is full of treachery and deceit, even a bit of king-killing, not really England's finest hour. So, as I hope I've begun to hint, as far as I'm concerned, the idea of Britain, or indeed England, as a chaste virgin at its best when protected from foreign defilers and seducers, is a load of nonsense. But that doesn't mean it isn't an extremely powerful idea. Perhaps it's because of this notion of Britain as a virgin that insults directed at the French seem so often to hint at their sexual forwardness or promiscuity. You'll be familiar with the phrase, pardon my French, for when we use bad language, often sexual in nature, certainly very rude. French kissing is, of course, to kiss with tongues, which isn't necessarily bad manners unless the other person really isn't expecting it, but seems to imply that it's a bit too forward for the British. Carrying on in this vein, a French novel is a somewhat quaint term for pornographic material, a French letter is a condom, and yet, also somewhat perversely, the French pox is syphilis. The cumulative suggestion of these phrases is, is that the French are rude, louche, and oversexed. The British are cleanly and modest. There's some parallel here, I will suggest, to the British attitude to European integration. We'd rather stay behind our moat defensive, thank you very much, and don't even think about trying to kiss us. But in the interest of intellectual honesty, I'm going to have to blow a hole in my own theory now. Constructively, I hope. You may be familiar with the phrases I've just used, but did you know that the French return the compliment? In France, a condom is capote anglaise, an English cap, and the French pox has been called la maladie anglaise. Uh, then there's le vice anglais, which seems to have been used for all sorts of ideas about what's wrong with the English, but mostly, intriguingly, a fetish for flagellation. The latter came from the popular idea that English public schoolboys were regularly whipped at school, which they were once upon a time, and as a result developed a fetish for being whipped, which I can neither verify nor deny. But I'm going off topic. This example serves as a word of warning. On the one hand, I'd like to suggest that the tropes I'm discussing today, in which Britain sees itself as uh, a virgin and outsiders, particularly their nearest neighbours and sometimes enemies, the French, as defilers, arises from a specific context, from Britain's island identity and its fear of either being caught up in some of the tumult of politics and war on the continent, or later, of its sense of self being dissolved into the larger European whole.
It's also true to say, however, that the kinds of tropes I'm picking up today occur in other contexts. When countries wish to insult each other, sexual insults are amongst the forms that those jibes take. Syphilis is neither a British nor a French disease after all, just something which most nations are keen to dissociate themselves with and blame on their enemies. But just because these insults are baseless doesn't mean they have nothing to tell us. Stereotypes can tell us a lot about the historical context in which they came about, and in turn, a bit of context can help us deconstruct our stereotypes. To live in the contemporary age in Britain is to inherit a great number of ideas about the French, ideas whose origins we don't always know and whose significance we can't fully appreciate. This leaves us unable to evaluate these ideas properly. So, to begin our historical odyssey, as British Studies students, you've now studied a number of historical moments in which the British and French have come into contact with each other and fought. The Norman invasion, the Angevin Empire, the Hundred Years' War, the Seven Years' War. Hardly a century goes by when the Brits and the Frogs aren't having a bash at each other. I want to begin the story, however, in the 18th century, a little before the Channel Tunnel is first seriously proposed, but when the climate into which such ideas will emerge is being formed. The Grand Tour was a trip taken by British men and the occasional chaperoned women around the continent. France was a prime destination. It was designed to broaden horizons and add a bit of cultural polish. In 1788, John Villiers, an aristocrat, traveller and indefatigable letter writer, wrote home saying, every young man ought to go abroad. I find everything here so extremely inferior that I glow with pride and rapture when I think I am an Englishman. <laughs> Not really the idea, but nice that he got something out of it. This picture represents a young man planning his grand tour, a journey traditionally taken by young men of means around the continent. Uh, and this picture here, sadly for my purposes, is by a German artist, but the scene it depicts is one that would have played out in living rooms around England. A young man has a map in front of him and is apparently planning his travels. But if you ask me, he doesn't seem to be looking at the map so much as that young lady's décolletage, pardon my French. Uh, the Grand Tour was ostensibly designed to give young men a bit of polish, but it was also a way of getting them out of the way in a period when university educations were not that well respected. These young men had not yet come into their estate, they had not yet married, but their hormones were raging. Better to send them abroad where the scandal could at least be contained. The title of this 1732 painting by Jean-Honoré Fragonard roughly translates as The Happy Accidents of the Swing. <laughs> the happy accident here is that the young woman, pushed by an older man, who may be either her husband or perhaps a serving man, is kicking her frothy petticoats in the air and the man in the foreground hiding in her bushes. Sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> bushes <laughs> is having a peep at her knickers yes <laughs> it was commissioned by a french dramatist <laughs> Charles Cole as a present for his mistress it now hangs in a british gallery i'm so sorry i'm gonna have a little drunk drink of water i'm gonna recover myself <laughs> i've demonstrated my own point about the prudishness of the british this is wonderful wonderful stuff Anyway, hangs in a British gallery, although it's by <coughs> a French uh, artist and French patron. Um, this picture is a reminder of the moment of uh, Rococo, which was so popular in France, but which was certainly a hit over here in Britain. French manners were considered to be very different, and French women were considered to be more available. One London paper at the time noted that a Frenchman will suffer you to court his wife before his face. The word coquette, defined as a woman who flirts insincerely for a man's attention, is of French origin and would have been in use at this time. But France represented worse peril than a bit of flirting. In 1739, an English journalist wrote, I look upon France as the hotbed to our English youth, where they are immaturely ripened and therefore soon become rotten and corrupt at home. Paris, the historian Jeremy Black argues, was the great centre of sexual activity for British tourists. It was the city in which they tended to spend most time, access to local society was relatively easy, and there were numerous prostitutes. It's unsurprising that a number of moneyed lads on tour in a city with a massive underclass created a real boom in the prostitution business in Paris, but guidebooks of the time tend to position the English travellers as preyed upon victims rather than the demand which creates supply. Many unguarded foreigners have been seduced by those notorious villains, warns one. <laughs> 
When the young men, predictably enough, picked up venereal diseases and were treated for them in France, the notion that the men were suffering from French vices and diseases was born. Young men on the continent risked bringing these vices and diseases home, polluting the domestic space, or even leaving a child on the other side of the channel who might ruin his reputation. Naturally, it was France that got the blame for all of this, not the travellers, allowing a vision of Britain as sexually pure to be maintained. The popularity of the Grand Tour largely sloped off in 1789 with the French Revolution as more and more letters came home in which evening strolls around the Tuileries were curtailed by the off-putting sight of heads on spikes, or trips to the hairdresser were rudely interrupted by shooting in the streets. Intrigued but afraid, most British travellers stayed away. Some British romantics were undaunted though. William Wordsworth went to France to see what all the excitement was about and fathered a child with French Annette Vallon while he was there. He supported the child throughout his life, but despite her hopes to the contrary, never publicly acknowledged or married Vallon. Other tourists seemed less tuned in to the tumult in France than we might expect. Our old friend John Villiers writes another cracking letter home in which he informs everyone that the women go without hats, without a blush or the least consciousness of impropriety. This is what shocks him at this time. In 1802, the Revolutionary Wars came to a brief cessation with the Peace of Amiens. This cartoon, entitled The First Kiss This Ten Years, pictures Britain as Britannia, complete with shield and trident set aside, and France as a wiry, seductive fellow who has laid down his sword, but whose pigtail looks unsavoury and excited. <laughs> he is saying, Madame, permitting me to pay my profound esteem to your engaging person and to seal on your divine lips my everlasting attachment. Britannia is saying, Monsieur, you are truly a well-bred gentleman, and though you make me blush, yet you kiss so delicately that I cannot refuse you, though I was sure you would deceive me again. From the British point of view, uh, time would show that Britannia was wrong to let down her maidenly guard. Britain and France were back to fighting by 1804. In this brief pause, however, the first plan for a channel tunnel was proposed, and it was proposed by a Frenchman. In 1802, a mining engineer named Albert Mathieu proposed a plan to Napoleon which involved a tunnel lit by candles designed for horse-drawn carriages. This was a golden age for invention and engineering in Britain too, particularly in terms of canal building, uh, was taking off and Mathieu hoped to work with the British. But not to be outdone, an Englishman, Henry Mottray, came up with another design in 1803, this one using a submerged tunnel rather than one under the seabed. Unfortunately, it was a bad time to be talking about building bridges, or tunnels even. This cartoon was drawn in that year. It shows the French attacking by sea, by tunnel and by hot air balloon. The English defence seems to involve men suspended from kites, taking the odd pot shot at them, uh, which seems a little bit haphazard to me, but I'm not a military woman, so... <laughs> It's not surprising then that when Napoleon approached the British ambassador to ask what he thought of the scheme, the answer was a firm no thank you. A tunnel was considered to be a military threat, a chink in Britain's armour. Britain had always placed enormous emphasis on the superiority of its navy because it was a country with sea borders. Opening it up to an extra means of attack was a frightening prospect. The plan was set back though, on the French side um, at least, explorations continued in the form of geological investigations into the seabed of the channel. Engineering was moving forwards in Britain, the progress of the railways was steaming on and Robert Stevenson's success with the mile-long Glenfield Tunnel in Leicester encouraged British engineers to dream big. Queen Victoria was actually quite receptive to plans to build a channel tunnel, mostly because she suffered acutely from seasickness. Confusingly, France and Britain are actually allies at this point. They fought on the same side against Russia in the Crimean War. Nevertheless, the British Foreign Secretary Palmerston wasn't keen on the idea of the tunnel. What? He said. You expect us to contribute to an operation that would shrink a distance that we already find entirely too short. In 1856, someone gets the conversation going again, and once more it's a Frenchman. Aimé Tomé de Gamon is sometimes referred to as the father of the tunnel between France and England, and the poor man certainly deserves some kind of accolade. He spent a great deal of his life being rowed across the channel by his daughter, where he would then proceed to dive to the seabed to carry out experiments, undaunted by the attention he received from curious conga eels. <laughs> After proposing a total of seven designs, in 1867 his plans were finally accepted by the Emperor and Queen Victoria. A plan for a mined railway tunnel with a sandbank station halfway across the channel with not only an air shaft, but also a hotel on it. But then the Franco-Prussian War broke out. 
Although it didn't involve the British directly, it confirmed to the British that the right path to pursue at this time was isolationism, to stay as far out of European power struggles as possible and focus on the empire. The Earl of Derby announces that, placed as it is with regard to geographical position, Britain should not entangle itself with Europe. The Virgin Island was not yet ready to join itself to another. Due to British opposition, the project was shelved. Paul Gamon died bankrupt and depressed. In the 1870s and 80s, there are engineers and committees aplenty on both sides of the channel trying to get the plan off the ground. The technology and the funds for the project seem possible. Work actually begins in 1875, although as usual the French were the keener party, creating a shaft in the small village of Songat and the beginning of a tunnel section. But as usual, the political climate in Britain just wasn't right. In 1883, both Houses of Parliament passed a joint resolution terming the plan inexpedient. Sir Randolph Churchill, ancestor of the future Winston, announces his distaste for the project on the basis that the island of England, for which I suppose we must understand he meant Britain, had always been Virgo intacta and that this would be compromised by the building of the tunnel. In Churchill's imagination, the tunnel becomes a kind of continental phallus with which the protective hymen of British virginity, its splendid isolation, is compromised. Churchill was a great Victorian case study in hypocrisy, very prudish in public, suffering from a bit of the old French pox on the side. The military were also against the idea. General Sir Garnet Wolseley argued that the tunnel would represent a constant inducement to the unscrupulous foreigner to make war upon us. Petitions were signed and the tunnel was abandoned. For decades and decades, there was no real progress. Bills raised and bills quashed, always by the British, always on military grounds, and often with reference to imagery of sexuality and corruption. I have to confess, I have very little idea what's actually going on in this, which is entitled Hopes and Fears, A Dream of the Channel, and it appears in Punch. The British seem to be represented by some very worried looking moles, and the French are wearing Napoleonic hats and seem to have unleashed an eel on them. Um, I can imagine what Freud would make of this imagery, but as a very sensible Englishwoman, uh, I say nothing. <laughs> World War I brings its own fears of invasion. Documents released from the Public Records Office in the 1990s revealed that Britain feared that Germany might be digging a tunnel towards them and the Navy were instructed to look out for suspicious muddy water. Uh, the, poster, sorry, the public were asked to remember that uh, the, the German army had invaded the coastal town of Scarborough in which 137 civilians were killed. I'm going to have to flip forwards, I'm sorry. There we are. Uh, so here's Britannia again, urging the men to defend her sea borders. As for the French, they had been allies since the Entente Cordiale of 1904, very confusing. Uh, but when the war was won, David Lloyd George argues that we ought to build a tunnel so that the British might be able to help the French if they're in need again. But no one really goes for that at all. Moving back to Conan Doyle here, he is the author, of course, of the Sherlock Holmes stories. He wrote a story in which Britain is damaged for the lack of a tunnel, starved to death by attacks made on ships of food supplies. Admiral Sir William Kennedy attacks Conan Doyle's story, saying, God made us an island. By all means, let us remain so. The interwar years um, are characterised by more suspicion of abroad. This is an illustration from Science Today, which shows a design featuring a sump on each side through which England or France could elect to flood the tunnel should they ever fight. Uh, in a particularly extravagant display of xenophobia, the Earl of Crawford made a speech in Parliament in which he warned that the Channel Tunnel would expose the English to French proponents of nudity, along with a smorgasbord of other vices, including pornography and prostitution. The Second World War was a boom time for appeals to imagery of Britain as an island with an emotional focus on its coastline. The evacuation of the French beach of Dunkirk, in which hundreds of smaller boats owned by ordinary Britons were used to save the heroic soldiers from the enemy advance, helped to consolidate the very old idea that crossing the Channel is a dangerous business. Following the evacuation, Churchill had the public imagine that their island nation would fight the enemy on the beaches. Uh, Vera Lynn sang White Cliffs of Dover to boost the soldiers' morale by helping them to imagine their homecoming across the Channel. Unfortunately, she promises bluebirds over the White Cliffs of Dover. There are no bluebirds here in the UK, but uh, nobody seemed to mind. The mood in Britain after the war towards the continent was mixed. In an article describing what it was like to grow up in post-war Britain, contemporary novelist Hilary Mantel described the nations in the following term. The gaunt old virgin Britannia had once again spat in the eye of the European rapist. The island status, the separateness of Britain or England, was essential to her understanding of herself. 
To a much greater extent, Britain had not managed to stay as isolated in the Second World War, suffering bombing and even an occupation on the outlying Channel Islands. It was hard to shake the feeling that contact with the continent would always be this bruising. Nevertheless, technology had moved on to such an extent that its obsession with attack from a tunnel was beginning to look somewhat quaint. As Terence Gorvish writes, the transformation of military technology which it produced, aircrafts, rockets and finally the atomic bomb, made the idea of barriers redundant, producing a major chink in the military objections to a tunnel in the post-war period. Barriers were going down all over Europe in more senses than one, although Britain was wary of plunging into the new drive towards European togetherness, which would render war between its nations not only unthinkable but materially impossible. Its objections were, and continue to be, complex, but tend to rely on the idea that Britain is fundamentally different from the rest of Europe. In terms of its history, that is its empire, its relationships beyond Europe, its special relationship to the USA, and its geography, its island status, something which doesn't seem to have the same weight for the more Europhile island nation of Ireland, interestingly. Nevertheless, there was a lukewarm endorsement of, um, of Europe and of a proposed tunnel. In 1955, Harold Macmillan, British Defence Minister, announced that he no longer opposed a fixed link on military grounds, and by 1960, plans were being presented by the Anglo-French Channel Tunnel Study Group. 20 years later, plans begin, and no sooner do they begin than Britain pulls out. Uh, it may please Monty Python fans to know that uh, this is the year that Monty Python and the Holy Grail comes out, 1975, featuring comedy of noxious Frenchmen who seem to have taken over a succession of English castles and refused King Arthur entrance, taunting, your mother was an Amster and your father smelt of elderberries. Uh, as far as I know, fear of taunting was not a factor in pulling out of Channel Tunnel plans, uh, but deep into an oil crisis, Prime Minister Harold Wilson said the project simply couldn't be funded. In 1979, a very unlikely hero comes to the rescue. Margaret Thatcher. Now, I can't stress this enough. Thatcher's support for the Channel Tunnel is surprising. Thatcher is not remembered as a Francophile politician, nor one who was enthusiastic about Europe in general. In fact, members of her own party resigned because they found her so intransigent on the subject of Europe. It could be argued it's the issue which caused her party to push her out of power. She promoted a very traditional, even jingoistic, vision of Britain, which played on the old tropes of isolationism which we've encountered already. In her famous Bruges speech, in which she basically outlined why the current model of European integration wouldn't work for Britain, she said that it was from our island fortress that the liberation of Europe itself was mounted, stressing the sacrifice made by Britons for Europeans, rather than any sense that Britain too was once under threat. In her book, Statecraft, she referred to a unified Europe as a classic utopian project, a monument to the vanity of intellectuals, a programme whose inevitable destiny is failure. She was not a hit with the French. Uh, invited to some celebrations of Bastille Day and asked her opinion on the French Revolution, Thatcher replied to the effect that it was a bit overrated and that Magna Carta it was the place that human rights really began and our quiet revolution of 1688 was much more worth shouting about. The tabloids, who quite liked taking a pop at the French anyway, responded gleefully when Thatcher clashed with Jacques Delors about European Currency Union. Subtle as ever, the sun there. Uh, like Britannia, Thatcher was always depicted as a warrior, but a warrior uh, woman. Attacks on her by the French uh, for Thatcher's defenders uh, made them feel they must come to her aid as Britannia. She was never called an empty-headed animal food trough wiper like in Monty Python, but Pre President Destang did once dismiss her as the daughter of a grocer. To the British people, she was often thought of as a warrior, or less flatteringly, as a battle axe. Her hair described as a helmet, her trusty handbag wielded as a weapon. According to one commentator, she will always be remembered as Boudicca with a handbag, helmet-haired Gloriana, Britannia with a cruise missile. Despite all that, it was Thatcher that gave the tunnel the go-ahead. And we're still pondering her motives, frankly. Some say she wanted it to be one of her legacies. The breakthrough in the tunnel happened mere days after Thatcher's resignation on the 1st of December 1990. Engineers from the British and French side, with the very unlikely names of Mr. Fag and Mr. Cosette, shook hands. Britain was Virgo intacta no more, but it would, be more, it would be four more years full of delays and ballooning costs before the tunnel opened. The British public was far from a starry-eyed newlywed. The Sun newspaper was classically restrained in voicing its doubts about the project. It printed a list of indictments against the French, including that they banned British beef after falsely claiming it had mad cow disease, bleated when we found their foul soft cheese was riddled with listeria bugs, there it is, 
Boo and hiss of the cheese. Uh, they gave in to the Nazis during the Second World War when we stood firm, tried to conquer Europe until we put Napoleon down at Waterloo in 1815. And remember, folks, it won't be long before the garlic breathed Bastilles will be here in droves once the Channel Tunnel is open. They urged its readers to direct their voices across the Channel and tell the filthy French to frog off. Even those papers who felt that they ought to be excited about the project couldn't quite muster enthusiasm. The Independent commented, it will transform Britain from an island into a part of Europe. And how do we feel about it? Indifferent, uninvolved, irritated, confused, uncomfortable, rotten. What a damn pity that is. So far, not only has it failed to capture the public's imagination, but people are adamant that they will not use it. One of the major grounds for alarm, now that the tunnel really seemed to be going ahead, was that the tunnel would bring infection from the continent. Uh, not return tourists with the clap this time, but creatures with rabies, which had been stamped out in Britain in 1902. Why an alien creature would want to enter the tunnel, traverse its length of 35 miles, and emerge keen to bite the British public is uncertain. <laughs> Yet the power of this fear to the British public should not be underestimated. Author Julian Barnes suggests that for the people of Britain, it was as if lining up behind Mitterrand and the Queen as they cut the tricolor ribbon at Calais were packs of swivel-eyed dogs, fizzing foxes and slavering squirrels, all waiting to jump on the first boxcar to Folkestone and sink their teeth into some Kentish flesh. <laughs> Perhaps then, Barnes suggests, the fear of rabies was a kind of transference of British feelings of fear of the foreigner, which could not find any other form of expression. Putting up electrified grills to stop bats from flying through was a kind of displaced fear of the filthy French, as the sun would have put it. A late example of the British tendency to style themselves as untainted and as pure. Julian Barnes is an interesting case. A British author who strongly identifies as a Francophile and whose writing often satirises what is sometimes called the Little Englander sensibility. He nevertheless has his own reservations about the tunnel. The old nation states of Europe are gradually being homogenized into herdable groups of international consumers separated only by language, he laments. In the months leading up to the tunnel's opening, he says, if we are in our car, the shuttle will gain us 30 or 40 minutes, but will, I think, finally lose us something much more important, a sense of crossing the channel. He speaks elegiacly of the experience of everything from the silhouette of honking gulls against the receding Sussex coast to those extra handles in the lavatories to stop you falling over. There he is. It might seem mysterious at first, a lover of France who doesn't want to bring France any closer, but as Barnes persistently points out in his writing, his love of the French is based on the idea that they're fundamentally different from the British. The French are so, well, French, and therefore designed by God to seem as provokingly dissimilar from the British as possible. Catholic, Cartesian, Mediterranean, Machiavellian in politics, Jesuitical in argument, Casanovan in sex, and relaxed about pleasure. And different is how Barnes likes the French. His fear is not that the French will invade and overwhelm the British, but that the two will be submerged into a joint European identity in which something is lost. When the tunnel finally opened in 1994, it was more than a year late and at a cost of £9.5 billion, pounds, double the original budget. It was opened by Queen Elizabeth and the French President in a ceremony held at the glamorous end once again in France on the 6th of May 1994. Since then, it's faced plenty of trials and tribulations, technical difficulties, fires, financial trouble. It finally broke even in 2005. At the anniversary celebrations, it was revealed that new links um, are being created to Geneva and to Amsterdam, amongst others. So what's happened to old Iron Pants Britain? Have we warmed up to the French charm? Have we finally relaxed about the threat of attack from across the tunnel? Yes and no. Britain is certainly experiencing a spike in its scepticism about Europe in general, as evidenced by growing support for the UK Independence Party, but not by Francophobia in particular. But the Channel Tunnel has become a focal point for fears of invaders of a different sort and from different nations. Illegal immigrants, often refugees, who attempt to reach the UK through the Channel Tunnel, some of them prepared to risk anything to reach England. In one of the more remarkable stories, a couple from the Vale of Glamorgan in Wales were returning from holiday in France in their motorhome when stopping for a moment to refuel, a man climbed out from the undercarriage of their vehicle and walked away. He just stared in the window quite insolently and carried on walking, Mr Mullen reported. He must have been a pretty tough guy. He had clung onto the undercarriage of the vehicle for 100 miles. 
Stories of immigrants camped out around Calais who suddenly band together in vast numbers to attempt to overwhelm officials are becoming a regular event. The caption on this image doesn't say where these guys are from, but I really respect how the guy at the back is looking incredibly dapper and suave when you think he's basically been living homeless around Calais for many months. Uh, ironically, Britain's fear of invasion has become a bit of shared ground with the French. In this French cartoon, the British man is waving a flag angrily, uh, saying, at bottom, Europe is nothing but immigrants. And the French people are saying, oh, finally, they resemble us. So, fear of invasion by our neighbours continues. It's just that these days in Britain, the world is our neighbour, and the tunnel continues to channel our feelings, so to speak. I'll end on some hopeful words which come from our own dear Queen as she opened the Channel Tunnel. The French and British peoples, for all their individual diversity and ages-long rivalry, complement each other well, perhaps better than they realise.